<laughs> Thanks for that warm introduction. So let me get into it. Parenting, have we many parents in the room or online? Yeah, it's tough, isn't it? How do you know if you are doing harm or good as a parent, especially when you have a baby? Am I doing it right or wrong? Is it okay to feed a baby a chicken drumstick? Don't worry, I didn't do it with our baby. I, I cut up the chicken first, it was okay. And then I had this thought, you know, parenting's difficult. What if you could just do data-driven parenting? Just use a lot of data and help you guide your, all, yourself through those decisions. Should the baby sleep in the same bed as us, or the same room? What about the pros and cons of breastfeeding? Well, this economist, Emily Oster, went and got all that economic data that, and wrote a book and got all the best data to help drive those decisions. But when we look at data analytics, we often want to complement quantitative data with qualitative data, okay? So when it came to parenting, I wanted some guiding principles. So my wife and I agreed we wanted our daughter to be independent, respectful, tolerant of others, and essentially go and do good in the world. Okay, so, so far, three slides in, I've talked about economics, parenting principles, and nothing about perspectives or perception. So I better get onto the testing material at this stage. So, at various points in my testing journey, I asked the question, am I doing harm or good? Is there potentially data out there that could help me drive the decisions around the approach that I want to take to testing? And is there guiding principles out there that I could use to help guide my testing? And along the journey, I feel I've gone through three phases of my career, executor, partner, and influencer. And People who've been around quality testing space for a while may see some similarities in their career. And if you're, new, you're, if you're newer to testing, I'm hoping that perhaps this talk might give you some shortcuts to maybe potentially where you want to go next. So I'll start with the executor, and why it's the executor phase will become quite obvious in a moment. The kind of environment when I was an executor was a waterfall environment. All the projects were waterfall. I was working in telecoms, and then I switched to the financial services. There was a lot of silos, particularly between testers and developers. For the first seven years of my career, I sat with other testers. All the developers sat together, the business analysts sat together, which is quite sad. We were all in the same office, and we were physically separated from each other. Why it's the executor is because a lot of my time was spent executing test scripts, maintaining them, and it was very documentation heavy too. So often I would have spent up to six months writing test plans, documentations, test scripts, really big heavy waterfall style projects, and it forever put me off test scripts. And I'm going to talk about that topic more in the next few slides. A lot of the testing was done at the finish. So instead of trying to bake the quality in throughout, it was trying to test quality in at the end. And we know with a very long time uh, that that doesn't work. Elizabeth Hendrickson wrote a paper over 20 years ago showing the problems with that. And essentially, this is also the, the kind of mindset of breaking the software as opposed to working with others to make software unbreakable. So other observations I have in this kind of environment when I was an executor was there was a tunnel vision, and other, other speakers spoke about this today, a tunnel vision on requirements. So all, all the focus was get the requirements implemented, focus on functional testing, and many other quality characteristics such as performance and security were neglected or were an afterthought. And when it came to automation, uh, you may have seen in other talks today the test pyramid came up where typically you've got unit tests, integration tests, and then end-to-end -end tests at a UI or API layer at the top of the stack. Now, on many of these projects, there wasn't a pyramid, there was just a slice of UI tests and nothing else, which isn't very good, because when they fail, it's very f hard to figure out you know, what underlying software um, has caused that. So you generally know the flow that's broken, but you don't have any depth underneath that, and that's very challenging. And to give an example of it, when I was working 
for an insurance company in Sydney, I was on a, I joined a project, it was three months in, there was three months left, and there was no form of automation to help provide any form of safety net, so I used Stenium ID at the time, record, like record and playback, quick and dirty, cleaned up the code a bit, and that was our automation pack, you know, and that's essentially how a lot of these projects were. And you can tell fairly the tone of what the environments were like, there was a lot of hero culture. What I mean by hero culture is there certain people with certain information that made them the heroes or the people who were willing to work extensively long hours, okay? And that isn't a great environment to be in. Um, it isn't a psychologically safe environment. And what I mean by psychologically safe environment is an environment where you feel comfortable being yourself, uh, you're not intimidated or harassed, and that is an environment that majority of people will thrive in, in that psychologically safe environment. So what harm is being done at this stage? Delayed testing is a big problem because you're trying you know, to test the quality in at the end. Test scripts are a huge form of bottleneck and delay um, in their own right. And then we had this hero culture. And I was part of that hero culture. There was times I was on projects that I had spe specific knowledge and there was times when I was contracting, not even a daily rate, but an hourly rate, when I was working excessively long, excessively long hours, papering over the cracks of the project. At this point in my career, I, my influence was I had no test community interaction, okay? I didn't even talk to my colleagues about testing, okay? No books, no blogs, and all I had was certification. Okay, so I was an academic junkie. I did two postgrads in my 20s. I did Cisco exams, Linux exams, and then I did ISTQV exams. Okay, so ISTQV is, is fine within reason. I think ISTQV is probably a presentation in its own right, but it's okay as a starting point. Um, but how applicable it is to a lot of testing roles um, could be open to debate, so maybe that's a talk uh, for another time. So then I started the shift into what I call the partner phase of my career. And what the big shift here was, I was looking for a new environment. I'd left embedded systems, uh, financial s services like hedge funds and banking and insurance. And a games company that was based in Seattle opened an office in Cork in my, my home city. And it looked like a really cutting edge you know, company, great culture. And after much hesitation, I said I'd go and try to apply and get a job there. And it was a huge change. I had been in environments that had used Agile to a point, but were essentially Scrum implementations. This is truly Agile, where we you know, created small chunks of code, got feedback quickly, we were able to react. Um, really great environment. And it, for the first time in my career, I sat with the developers. They started to help me test, and I learned so much from them. I was learning Python. I had a developer behind, beside me who was an experienced Python developer who helped me through that, helped unblock me, and, and helped develop those skills. And I was exploring, pun intended, for an alternative to test scripts. So I felt test scripts were really heavy and, and weren't suited to an agile environment. But what was the alternative? Ad hoc testing? So was there something in the middle? And I was seeking an answer, and I joined this company, and the first day I asked them, where's the test case management tool? And they said, we don't have one. I was like, okay, I have to go cold turkey. I'm going to have to find a solution. And we were doing testing much earlier in the process. So before a line of code was written, we'd look at, right, what are the quality characteristics we care about here? What are the risks? And that was really great to have that kind of mindset. And the tunnel vision was no longer in place because we consider all the quality characteristics. So if we were working on a login feature, security and scale might be two key characteristics we'd go after. In the automation front, things improved a lot. We had the classic test pyramid now. The developers would write the unit test, integration test, and then testers would write the end-to-end -end test at the API and UI level if necessary, but in different technologies, uh, very separate activities. And I got exposure to things I'd never got exposure to in the past. So in the past, once the software was tested, I didn't know how it got to production. I, I, I thought files got moved around. I really didn't know. 
I'd never actually tested in production, never used feature toggles, and knew very little about the user experience. You know, so what features were customers using the most? And how do we know if a feature was successful or not if we had no data to back it up? And because it was a much more positive environment, and because the developers were pitching in with the testing and helping a lot more, it was a much more psychologically safe environment. But at this phase, what was the harm? I was still being a safety net for the team. And what I mean by that is I still had product knowledge I wasn't sharing with the developers and others. For example, um, in an e-commerce role, I knew how to test the credit cards, but the developers you know, didn't have that same level of knowledge. I also had you know, knowledge around certain levels of automation, but the real smell really was, around all this, was that toward, before we released, I and the other testers were very busy. And that's a smell in its own right that there was a problem there, that you know, we had a very busy couple of days just before we released software. And the problem there was control. I had a limiting belief that the developers couldn't test as good as I could. Now, all my experiences since then are quite the opposite. If you work with developers, they can actually become really good at testing, and you can work with them to help them become quality-focused developers. In turn, they'll share skills with you as well. And the other harm that was being done at this stage was an automation silo. We'd moved away from physical silos, and we'd created this automation silo that the developers wrote certain types of tests at various levels in their technologies, and we were writing tests at different levels in our technologies, so we'd formed a new silo here in automation. So I got some new influences. And what spurred a lot of these influences in engaging with this is that really great job disappeared. It was the second redundancy in a row. Then I went to another company, and they, they closed the office. I went to another project, and the project was cancelled. So it was four experiences like that in a row. And at that stage, you can imagine, you're pretty disheartened. And you're like, what, where is this all going? Like, so I said, OK, I'm going to try to find a new way of approaching testing, or I'm going to call it a day and do something different. It, was, you know, it, was, it felt like that. So if I had a summer where I was on gardening leave, which is a flight or a nice term for saying you're paid not to work so you don't go and work for a competitor. And a lot of my friends and, and family and stuff would have been working, so I had a lot of time to think. So I started to engage with the community that summer for the first time ever. And one thing that really caught my eye was the schools of testing, especially the context-driven school of testing, which led me to go on a course called the Rapid Software Testing Course, which is close to many people. Uh, in the room, um, and Michael Bolton led that course, and that was really good, some of the topics I learned at that. And that ter in turn led um, you know, to involvement in with the Ministry of Testing and communities like that, and also to start reading books on the topic. Now, two key books that I call out is the work of Lisa Crispin and Janet Gregory. Uh, their book, Agile Testing Condensed, was shown in the last talk by Julia. And what a real learning from that book is around the concept of whole team testing, where everyone pitches in and helps with testing efforts. Another great book was Elizabeth Hendrickson's book, Explore It, which is super, and Marit does wonderful work around exploratory testing as well. And I started listening to podcasts, and the first podcast I ever listened to, it's known as Test Guild now, um, Joe Calantonio does it. So he, he originally was doing the podcast um, as a side project, an automation podcast. Since then, he's gone full-time with Teskill Conference and three podcasts. But that podcast and automation really showed all the problems that I'd seen in the automation silo. And he started to show approaches that UI automation didn't have to be flaky by nature, and that developers should drive the automation, and testers should partner with them, because the developers are the ones who write, who design and implement code and they're the specialists in it, and testers, for the greater part, haven't those same skills. So by partnering with those developers, you end up with much better quality frameworks and better automation as a rule of thumb. So I began to experiment, and people come to conferences, and they hear there was a problem, there's a solution, and then there was a happy ending, and you go back to work Monday morning, and you wonder, why is my job so difficult? Why? Because change is really difficult. You're going to fail more times than you succeed, but you go and you go again. So here's two failures on my part, <laughs> one, two of many. First is that I tried to teach 
developers exploratory testing by bringing them into a conference room and showing them slide decks. You can see that's not successful. <laughs> You're not surprised that didn't work. Another thing we tried to do at the time was, the way the, teams, the test team was set up at the time was, some uh, teams had up to three testers, and it would have been one manual tester and two automation testers. And uh, you, many of you may know Rob Meany in, in the, the wider community. Rob and I were working together at that time. It was our second time working together. And we came up with an idea that we tried to turn the whole t test team into a team of coaches, which is, is a good idea in principle, but not for where we were at that point in time. Um, there was a couple of problems. The testers didn't want to become quality coaches. Um, that wasn't good. The management team had a lot of concerns about it. And it fell flat, and it was good it fell flat because we weren't ready for it then at all at all. But what did work was, and where we had success, was around collaboration. So instead of trying to teach the developers around exploratory testing, we sat and paired with them and started to teach them about heuristics and mnemonics. And the unit test coverage naturally was higher, so we aimed for 90% branch coverage. So as an interesting exercise, sometimes we'd say, ignore the branch coverage, and let's go and write some interesting tests using some heuristics and mnemonics. And what we found was that we hit 90% by writing interesting test cases, uh, which was a nice experiment. Um, over time, then, as I began to work with a second team, we started using concepts like mobbing, which is ensemble testing, where the, there's just one person using the keyboard, um, mouse and screen, and everybody else is essentially helping out. And something that worked really well was bug bashes. Um, I know Lisa Crispin likes to call them bug hugs. But essentially, it, it touches on Rian's talk from this morning around bug bounties. It's, if you are, a, as a team, are at a point where you have a feature developed and you're confident about releasing it, a great thing you can do is bring another team in and, and get them to walk through the software and try it out and see which, what issues they can find. Uh, I think it works really well if you pick a one-hour slot, get people working in pairs, and, and it might help find some issues quite quickly. Um, and through things like the bug bashes, we, we started to spread these concepts around exploratory testing. So for some of those bug bashes, we didn't just ask developers and testers to them. We started asking people from the sales department, marketing, support team, and they came in with some great ideas. But what we used to do is hand out Elizabeth Hendrickson's uh, heuristics cheat sheet, and people in the sales department were starting to learn about these concepts as well, which was nice. The other thing that was successful was reflection. So we really started to encourage retrospectives in the team, so the team started to grow, and also post-mortems. So every time we had a production incident, we'd review what went wrong uh, within 24 hours and publish the results. Um, we, we learned a lot of that from our infrastructure team who were really good at incident management and running post-mortems, and we learned uh, how to do that from those teams. So, then it was time for the third phase of my career, I think. And what happened in the run-up to this was, based on the successes, I started to look at things like Lean, Kanban, uh, systems thinking, and started experimenting and trying out these things. And I felt that I was starting to move in to the third phase, the influencer phase. Some of the observations around this is that psychological safety isn't just an add-on at this point or a nice to have, it's a cornerstone of whatever, everything you do. And the culture of the company has to support that, and that's how you'll be successful, and that's what you look for if you're going into that influencer type role. Whether you want to call yourself a quality coach or have coaching as a skill, that is a really important skill set to have at this stage. So some people don't want to call themselves quality coaches, but I think having facilitation skills and being comfortable coaching developers around testing quality is really important. And three other observ observations around this phase is that typically you'll have buy-in around a holistic view on quality and that all quality characteristics are considered before the feature is implemented. Continuous testing is the norm, so none of this testing at the, at the start or the end, but taking every opportunity along the way to, to test. Like Dan Ashby has some great material around that, and Lisa Crispin and Janet Gregory, um, they've worked together essentially to create some very interesting models around that. And often DevOps is at the core 
of what these teams are doing. So what I mean by that is the teams have the autonomy to not just implement and test code, but get it all the way to production by themselves. And there's a huge investment in CI, CD as well. So what were my influences around this phase of my career? The first is the modern testing principles. So I looked at a lot of different principles, uh, Lisa Crispin and Janet Gregory's, uh, the system thinking principles, the Pop and Dick's uh, lean principles. But the one that I really settled on and really like is the seven modern testing principles by Alan Page and Brent Jensen, which I think are really good. They're neither modern or to do with testing. So a lot of it is from lean and, and quality focused uh, principles, but I really encourage uh, others to look at it. And this is where I'd start to come full circle. I said at the start, I was looking for some principles to help guide how to approach testing. And at this stage, I was starting to move into, you know, move back into an engineering manager role, having been a test manager in the past, switched to being a senior tester, and now going back into engineering manager role. I was using these principles to help guide the team I was leading. The book Accelerate provided the data. So I think the book Accelerate, which really I think you shared as well in the last uh, presentation, um, is one of the most significant books of the last 10 years at least in relation to it shows us that certain behaviors can be measured and then we see which successes we're having as a company. And what I mean by that is certain behaviors like psychological uh, safety that I touched on and team autonomy are huge factors around the behaviors you're looking for. And they have five metrics, one that focuses on availability, two that focuses on speed, and two focuses on uh, speed and failure as well. And that helps, you know, that book helps provide a lot of the data, and they touch on the value that testers bring around exploratory testing skills, and also as well, not to just focus on UI automation, but to focus on the automation around deployment as well. And the other thing that would have been a big influence is quality engineering. And somebody who's doing great work around this is Anne-Marie Sharrett. She's one of many in the community who's doing great work around this. So at this point then, what harm does an influencer do or what good can they do? So essentially what I've talked about is three phases here, which you could call traditional, agile, and then modern. So if we've had modern, can we have postmodern? Is essentially what I'm saying. And uh, Alan Page, who is one of the, of the creators of the modern testing principles of Brent Jensen, did a talk, Who's Ready for Postmodern Testing? And the three concepts he called out resonates with what I am seeing in the industry and others are seeing as well. And these three principles, I think, can help provide um, an approach for people to do good as testers and to avoid harm. So the first thing is the riser developer testing. More and more developers are being really quality focused where they're developing exploratory testing skills, they're, they're pitching in at automation, but they're also driving things like performance and security testing. DevOps is still continuing to have a, an influence and a huge impact on the industry. And the third thing is the rise of the quality coach. Like I was saying, whether you want to have a title as a quality coach or just have that coaching skill in your toolbox as a skill. Okay. So final stretch now, in the in conclusion part of the talk. <laughs> so today I called out three phases that many people's careers go through, which is executor, partner, and influencer. People should avoid the three S's. So avoid being a safety net for your team. Avoid, avoid solo testing, you know, for the majority of your time. And try to encourage developers to move away from solo to at least pairing activities. And... Avoid static. As you can see, over the 17 years of my career, all the changes that have occurred. So you can't stay static. It's really important to keep up with the latest trends and approaches. And instead, move towards the three Cs. The skill of coaching, ensuring you're collaborating with others, and embracing change. So finally, <laughs> the call to action is, as a tester, you're the training wheels for your team. Just like when a child is learning to ride a bike, the training wheels are supporting them. As a tester embedded in a team, your, your, your plan, I believe, for all testers is to figure out what skills do you provide that you can start to share with them? And how do you know that you're being successful around that? One thing is, when you go on holidays, how does it affect the team? Is there things that they're cautious 
about testing, or are they cautious about releasing software? And one great model is one that was created by Alan Page, which is the Quality Culture Transition Guide, is a great coaching um, template to use if you want to look at the quality maturity of a team you're working with. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Questions? So I tend to agree with a lot he said, but I hate the modern testing principles. And let me t explain why, because I fully agree with four of them, but the fifth tends to dismiss serious testing. And I'm, I spoke to Ellen a lot about it, so... so I think he badly framed it, and, and, or maybe I don't not fully understand, or he doesn't frame it my way. Yeah. I don't care. So, but I don't want to talk about what Ellen thinks. I want to talk about what you think. So, where is the serious, does serious testing have a place? Because you said, like, the, the DevOps culture, yeah. which to me seems a little bit too much focus on automate everything, which is a great concept mm. if you don't take it literally. Yeah. Um, so where is the where is serious testing has a place in, in, in these things? In the principles or overall in the, the yeah, overall picture? Overall. Like one, like one like thing that I would always say when I work with teams is explore. Use those exploratory testing skills and then automate the important things. And what I mean by that is if you know automation, start with synthetic monitoring tests and work from there. So like as a general principle, that's what I would say. Use your exploratory testing skills and then have your automa and then automate. The, the seven principles seem to violate serious testing. Not everybody can do it. It's, 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 a, it's a profession. I would say that it's a, I think it taken to an extreme that can be a limiting belief to say, I think everyone can test can everyone be the more, you know, can every developer in a team be as good as the test specialist who've dedicated their career to it? Perhaps not. I've seen some really great examples of it. But it is a limiting belief that the tester is the only one who should do testing in the team and that the developer shouldn't buy in. And that's, that's a problem. Exactly. I that's fully agree with that. Says. The principle says everybody can test. And that's bullshit. Everyone can test. It doesn't say everyone can. You can click around. <laughs> Everyone can test to some ability, not that it doesn't, yeah. Do you want me to stay with your one or do you want me to go to Ben? No, no, go to Ben. Are you sure? Because yeah. it looks like Ben wants to have some fun with this topic do, too. Do you guys want to fight over the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> or do you have a question somewhere that I missed? No. Yeah, I'd say I agree that everyone can test in the same way that we can say everyone can program. People can learn, but this actually dismisses testing as a skill while not dismissing other roles involved. Uh, the other thing I say, their customer is king. They say the customer is the only one that can determine quality. It dismisses all other stakeholders, which I believe is absolutely reckless. Well, the way I look at... And I've had this conversation with Adam, too, and he says, no, only the customer. Yeah, so the way I look at it, like, so essentially... I've listened to all the podcasts. I know how many people here, but there's hours and hours of like I don't know, hundred like, oh, yeah, well yeah. <laughs> that's right. So so I don't know how many. I don't know. Is there hundreds of hours of podcasts? Yeah, yeah. So like I've listened to what they've said and I've discussed it with others. Like what I get from principle five, right, is the customer shouldn't be doing the testing. Okay, the test specialists are required. Is my perspective on it, right? But the customer is the only one who can determine quality to the point that you're solving my problem to the point that I'm willing to pay for it. So you, you've solved my problem, and now I'm going to pay you for that. No tester can determine that. We can in, try to ensure they have a, a wonderful user experience, but we, we're not the customer. We're, 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 we don't have their problems. Right, but we're the customers. The customer <laughs> is not the only stakeholder who matters. We could satisfy the, company, the customer and bankrupt our company, and we're not fulfilling the, you know, satisfying the investors or owner of the company. Yeah. Uh, we could create something that's quality to the customer, 
but is so difficult to uh, maintain that it leads to abusing the team that needs to operate it. Yeah. So there are so many other stakeholders involved. The general public can say, someone asks us to build bombs, and the customer is the only one that knows quality. This is where I get into, this is reckless, and that's kind of an extreme, okay. but we can get yeah. there. That we also have a responsibility to society. And uh, you know, there is much more than the customer uh, who are is, you know, stakeholders that we need to be concerned about in understanding quality. Sure. I agree with the part of we should be talking to and get to know the people uh, that we serve, but it's much more than the customer. Yeah, and another softened view of it as well is I work with a lot of teams whose software doesn't go directly to the customer downstream. So their platform enabling teams and downstream teams work with them. So they view that downstream internal team as their customer. So in that case, are they solving the problems of that downstream team is another view of it as well, which is a much softer stance, let's say, yeah. Uh, was, there's no questions online. Is there any more in the room? Any questions in the room? Does everyone need a coffee don't, break after all that? It <laughs> got a little bit tense, I think. Yeah, of course we're friends. Yeah, we can talk about these things. <laughs> yeah, it's really difficult to follow up after this, but <laughs> um, I was wondering because I think a lot of harm is being spread by influencers in the testing space that have been out of the game for decades, um, and it makes it really hard to filter good from bad information and I was wondering how you how you do it if you have a tip to find the good information it, it sounds no different to the problems we're having <laughs> with influencers spreading disinformation I guess you're saying essentially we're having the same problem in the test world um, I, I, I guess you have to have a certain level of skin in the game and to be taken seriously as, as somebody who's an influencer let's say in the testing uh, frame. On a personal level, like I'm not as hands-on as I used to be, so over the last two years, I have a team of seven testers that I trust, you know, and I work closely with to ensure, you know, that, you know, that I'm, that's what I'm saying, along with them coming to conferences like this and engaging with people as well is a good thing. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it doesn't make sense if somebody's out of, if, if you don't have skin in the game, essentially, and they've moved out with, with, with an extended period of time, um, that's not good. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's all I can say, I guess, yeah. But a tip around it, I suppose, is coming to conference like this, engaging with people, figuring out what's really happening on the ground, at a minimum, if you're not hands-on anymore. But if you are out of the testing quality space and you've gone a different direction, maybe that's where you should focus on. So essentially, for example, if you've gone on an engineering management path and you're like director, then it makes more sense um, to be working on something like you know, you know, the Managing Up podcast, which focuses on, is a podcast for engineering managers and the skill set of an engineering manager to maybe shift into a space like that instead, uh, rather than staying with where you used to be, maybe. Thank you. Okay, well, a round of applause to our, to our speaker. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.